If you recall, Raymond Davis was barely 15 years old when he made local headlines by shooting and killing a man for no apparent reason other than to steal $4 from the man's wallet. Let's look at his history. Raymond moved from Oklahoma to Tennessee and ultimately came to Texas because I guess he passed out all his greeting cards in the first two states and figured he might as well look elsewhere for acceptance. He really had no roots. A grandmother and then a pair of aunts were Raymond's earliest caregivers. But from the time he was 11 years old, his guardians were mostly juvenile jailers and psychiatric treatment center employees. From some of his relatives, Raymond learned that his father had been re released from a Texas prison after serving 13 years for an aggravated robbery and decided he'd get to know him. An aunt who didn't like Raymond purchased a one-way ticket to Waco where I live and work. And soon the youth's new resting place was the concrete floor of a public housing apartment where his father lived with a girlfriend. Within six days, father and son got into a fist fight. Apparently Raymond won the fight, but he lost his meager meal ticket and he had to move in with somebody else. So he moved in with a 19 year old girl who lived nearby. Yeah, I know. Four weeks later, Raymond's residence was an eight by 10 cell in juvenile detention. I thought I'd try to contact his mother to gain her perspective on family history. Frankly, I was surprised when she answered the phone on the second ring as I called her one evening from the comfort of my home. Immediately, I wondered about her residence, what it looked like, how it smelled, whether or not it was clean, how many people flopped there at night, how much food sat in the fridge. When Raymond's mother answered the phone, the disheartened tone in her voice suggested that just as her son had murdered a man, someone killed her soul a long time ago. Her heart still pulsed, but not much else seemed to be on fire. I told this mother who I was and why I was calling. I referred to her as Mrs. Johns, but she promptly corrected me by saying, it's Cheryl, as if she uh, didn't dwell on formalities. Cheryl said thank you when I told her I was sorry her son was in trouble. As kindly as I could, I asked Cheryl to explain why she and her son had been apart for so much of his life. I visualized her shaking her head and had to strain to hear her say, it just didn't happen that way. Using her words as a lead in, I asked, what did happen? Her very words were this, a whole lot of shit. It was a whole lot. Can you find a place to start, I asked. You want me to tell you about me and Raymond's daddy, she asked. Yeah, I'd like to know about that, I said. Cheryl said, I heard he got out of prison and ended up in Texas. That where you're calling from? Yes, ma'am, Waco, Texas. Is it hot there, she asked. Yes, it sure is. The temperature hit 99 degrees today and everyone was relieved it wasn't worse. You know, I didn't have the heart to tell Cheryl at that point in time that Texas prisons, which would no doubt provide room and board to her son for who knows how many years, aren't air conditioned. That's right, they're not air conditioned, but that's another story for another day. Cheryl asked me, so is Raymond's daddy a bad dude? Is he still bad? I haven't met him yet, I told her, but I hope to. Well, if you do, she said, don't mention my name. Tell me about him, I asked. What was his name? How did you and he meet? His name's Tevis, Tevis Davis, she said. We went to school together, but he quit before I did. He said he was gonna get a job, but he just ran drugs with them gang homeboys of his. Tevis was in a gang, I asked. That's what they said, she told me. I couldn't really tell you, I didn't like his friends any more than I liked him, but yeah, I imagine it was true. So were you all together long, I asked. To be honest, she said, I'm not sure if I'd know him right now if I saw him. Back in the day, we got along for a minute, but mostly it was bad. No, we weren't together. You know, there's moments when I want to offer people unsolicited life lessons, and this was one of those occasions. At some point in time, even if just briefly, Cheryl and Tevis were together, if you get my drift. You know, the phenomenon of hooking up has never made much sense to me. As if an explanation is needed, two people agree to do it with no strings attached, one person growls, the other purrs, and there you have it, a hookup. 
A few short years ago, Dr. Donna Freitas wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal about the pitfalls of hooking up. In her research, Dr. Freitas found that a surprisingly high percentage of young adults who engage in casual sex feel rotten about their experience and about themselves. Even those who look hooked up regularly felt that way. So I wondered if Cheryl bore the pains left by a slap and dash encounter, same as those research subjects did. But back to Raymond's history. I asked Cheryl, so if the two of you were never together, what kind of relationship did you have? She said at first it was all right, but we fought mostly. Even though you were just teenagers? She said, that man's been fighting since he was little, and when he fought, he hit me like a grown man. But I hit him back like a man, too. I stabbed him once. I'm not afraid of anybody. But don't get me wrong. I'm not the fighting type, at least not anymore. Well, what about Raymond, I asked. Does he show similar tendencies? Cheryl kind of choked up. He was bad before he ever started the school. I love him because he's my son, but I'm just being honest with you. He was pretty bad. I know I wasn't the best mother in the world, but I love him. You need to know that much. You know, there's something likable about people who lay it all out on the table, and Cheryl was surely that type. There's no question I said that you love Raymond. Though I couldn't see her, I could picture Cheryl then nodding her head. No matter how far apart a mama and her boy drift, mothers never quit loving their children, even if their children commit odious acts of injustice. So after you and Tevis parted ways, I asked, what direction did you go? The wrong way, Cheryl said. And then she told a long tale of being kicked out of her mother's home when she was a teenager. Raymond wasn't any more than two years old at the time. She spoke of all the abuse she had endured as a child and in her adolescence, including sexual abuse at the hands of one of her mother's girlfriends. After speaking of her troubled life, Cheryl made a point to tell me, I didn't leave Raymond because I wanted to. He might think I did, but I didn't. I want you to know that too. Cheryl summarized her history by saying, thank the good Lord, Raymond was my only child. I read quite a lot on the topic of well-being and what it takes to re reach lofty psychological and spiritual heights. You know, some people prosper in spite of hardship and others fail. In simplified form, mental health professionals generally agree that successful, deep, and meaningful relationships play a pivotal role in thriving. Cheryl lacked those experiences in her youth, and in turn, she gave little to her son. It's not that she didn't want to give to him, but her bucket was dry, bone dry. I asked Cheryl more about her history and asked her to tell me where she had worked. Mm, I hadn't worked much to tell you the truth. I worked at a couple of bars, maybe a couple of fast food joints, sold weed a little bit. Well, tell me about the bars. What was your job there? Yeah, dance, take off my clothes, get people drunk so they'll buy more beer. Then she told me, you live like I do, and it didn't take, doesn't take much to get really messed up. I'm just being for real with you. You want me to be honest, don't you? So that's what I'm telling you. Roger that. Okay, let's go back to you and Raymond, I said. When he lived with you, how, how did you discipline him? I don't know, she said. I just did the best I could. Maybe whippings, take away his privileges. Nothing big, really. You know, all mothers and fathers have a parenting philosophy, whether or not they can articulate it. Parents who employ corporal punishment as their primary means of behavior management usually have less faith in a child's innate goodness than those who rely on positive means. My own bias is that the power and strength of the parent-child connection is the most effective disciplinary tool a mom or a dad can use. Raymond didn't come to his place in history alone. Like all of us, he received most of his identity from his family of origin and to a lesser degree from his culture. To the degree any of us can comprehend who we are, our emotional, social, and, re and relational health will be strengthened. Raymond jumped off that bus a long time ago. People who thrash about as they trudge from one day to the next are full of questions, troubling questions. 
Even if Raymond's birth was unplanned, unexpected, and unwanted, and everything suggests it was all of those things, his arrival wasn't all that abnormal. I mean, some children are birthed according to a grand timetable, but usually they just show up. Unplanned, though, doesn't equal unwelcomed or uninvited or redundant. Face it, some kids are lucky and some aren't. Raymond didn't voluntarily sign onto his mother's team as a free agent. He was drafted. About an hour into our phone interview, Raymond's mother asked when I was going to meet her son. I told her my first visit was scheduled soon. She instructed me, tell him Cheryl said she loves him if you don't mind. He'll know it's me. I told Cheryl goodbye and said it was a pleasure to talk to her, and I meant it. She asked expectantly would I be calling her again, and I said I would. Based on what I've told you about the mother of a 15-year-old boy who became a killer, let me ask you to consider these questions. What's your immediate reaction when you hear that someone, whether they're an, a, teen, a teenager or an adult, has done something really bad? Do you blame him? Do you blame the people that raised him? What do you think about that age-old controversy about the impact of nature versus nurture on a child's spirit? How hard is it to break free from the shackles of a painful childhood? Do all of us bear scars from our respective life experiences? I'm not ready to dismiss the significance between my starting point in life and that of a boy like Raymond Davis or his mother or his father. Does that resonate with you? I'm psychologist Lee Carter. I'll continue sharing my thoughts from this particular story in a series of upcoming videos. In this video, my aim has been to help you gain deeper understanding into how each of us are shaped by our respective histories. I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Comment below about your understanding about the effect history has on our identity development. I'll look forward to seeing you again soon.